Viewer discretion is advised. Your fave will be criticized. That's Chris. That's Jan. And welcome to CCTV, the nonstop pop show. And today we are speaking to a very special guest and celebrating the release of Steps What the Future Holds Tour DVD with music director Steve Anderson. If you're wondering who we are, Chris and I have a huge range of experience in the music industry from performing on stage to working at record labels, so we have a lot of insight into this crazy music industry, and you can join us on our conversations on Patreon, woo -hoo -hoo. <laughs> and you can join the crew at patreon.com slash cctvpops, and shout out to our crew members, Lisette, Lily, and Emily. Yes. All right, so let's bring in our special guest. Steve. Thank you so much for joining us, Steve. We are so honored to speak to a pop legend. How are you doing today? I'm doing really well. That's very kind of you to say that. Um, uh, I'm doing well. Yes, it's fine. It's quite sunny. I'm just out, live just outside of London. I'm in the studio outside of London. And it's, yeah, the sun mm. is shining. And it's a steps day. It's like I'm getting yes. some wonderful, because obviously we're talking on release day of the Platinum Collection. So uh, getting some really lovely comments about um, the few little bits and pieces I had to do with it. So it's it's a wonderful day. Yes, definitely. Yes. Happy Steps 25th anniversary to everyone out there. Um, but yeah, I've been a massive Steps fan since I was nine years old and a Kylie fan as well. So wow. you have really okay. made a big impact on my life. It's been some of the best concerts I've ever been to. So just wanted to thank you for all your work. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I listen. Thank you. And I mean, I'm I'm the same. I'm a massive Kylie fan and a massive Steps fan, so I'm with you as well. You know, uh, Chris actually introduced me to both acts uh, during the pandemic. Mm. Um, but what really got it started was Chris introduced me to Kylie by watching her concerts, and I was really impressed by the unique approach you took to even slow. I was like, I love jazz. My family, I went to like a jazz college and everything like that. And I thought, oh my, oh yes, yeah. this, is, this is what I want. <laughs> and then I heard the original and I said, oh my God, who would have thunk it? Oh my goodness. So super duper impressed by that one, for sure. One of my highlights. <laughs> Thanks. I mean, that's a lot of times um, my job is very much inspired by the creative directors and the, and the artists. And uh, particularly in that mm. situation with that song, there was always this idea of the, it was going to be quite burlesque and it was going to be quite, you know, the, the, the staging of it was going to feel kind of quite burlesque. And I have a weird knack and it's, it's, it's done me quite well, thankfully, but I have a weird knack when someone says that in my brain, I can just turn slow into like a Peggy Lee kind of jazz mm -hmm. cover. And then I can hear it in my brain and then I just got to figure out how to, how to make it. Oh, so, um, yeah, it's, I come from a remix background, so it, it's quite, it's, my brain works in that kind of way, reinvention. And it's kind of just like a re just rearrangement, really. It, I can hear lots of songs in lots of different ways. But thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed that. that of course. That's one of my favorites. Thank you. <laughs> you're, that's you're one welcome. of my favorites. <laughs> you're welcome. So you spent so many years working as a musical director for stars, including Kylie and Westlife. So how did you con get mm -hmm. connected with Steps? And what was your approach when taking on their discography? So the first, I was a massive Steps fan. I, I came from being mm. obviously a massive Stock Aitken and Waterman fan. And then I was a huge Steps fan when they first came. The first time I heard one for Sora, I was just immediately like, you know, okay, this is amazing. The vocals are incredible. Um, and, you know, and I loved everything they were about. Uh, and I just loved the fact that it was, there was loads of chords in it. It's sounded, you know, Pete mm -hmm. Waterman famously called the Abba on Speed. And I sort of mm -hmm. loved that. I, you hadn't heard those kind of songs for such a long time. So I loved it and I, and I loved everything about it. And, um, and the first time I ever did anything with any of them was, um, I was signed as a writer uh, at Universal Music Publishing and um, I had a little studio and they sent uh, Claire and H came mm. and we wrote to, to do a try a writing session, mm -hmm. which ended up being this B-side called Stop Me From Loving You, which is mm -hmm. like the you know most outrageously <laughs> camp ridiculous thing you've ever heard in your life. It's in an impossible key. Nobody else in the world could sing it. Um, and, and I remember them coming and they were really tired and it was a really hot day, but we did that. And then I, from that day on, I stayed in touch with Claire. Uh, and we kind of we became and still are really good friends. Um, but then the sec they obviously did loads of other stuff and then they split up for a bit. And when they came back, um, the sort of for the, the big one, um, they had, uh, I think she or someone had put me forward. I know their management pretty well mm -hmm. and suggested that I might be good. But I had to kind of I didn't it wasn't a shoe in. I had to like do the whole go and meet them all. 
you know really kind of go through it kind of go through the ideas i had and everything and um and i'd obviously met the others when we were recording that song as well um but yeah we we sat down and had a meeting about it and my one of my other really good friends uh frank strachan is a creative director for, for them and um we just we just hit it off really so um that's that i kind of got the job and then that was for you know that first the first tour mm -hmm. in uh, yeah. 2017. my job on that was just take rather than reinvent the wheel it was take mm. what they'd done mm -hmm. and supersize it basically Okay, interesting. So how would you describe the dynamic collaborating with the group and all the different creatives involved with the show? I think a music director is obviously so important to a set list, but how do you get involved in the process from the beginning set list creation and the tour concepts to then the final kind of music arrangement? I mean, the one thing for anyone that I work with, the, the person at the people or person at the center of it is the artist. Mm -hmm. So they're in, you know, in charge of that, you know, they're across everything because it's their show. And the, the people I work with have been doing it for a long time. So they know what works. Mm -hmm. um, but principally, the, the initial kind of group is would be the artist, the management. And, and a lot of my work is with the creative director, who in this in Steps case is Frank Strachan. Mm -hmm. um, and he will go about working out how the show will work as you've probably noticed from steps but also a lot of the shows i work on there are there, it's sections mm -hmm. you know there's yeah. different sections and it's also usually it's to do with um around an album so obviously the first one was around that kind of the comeback album mm -hmm. um so and that's you know how how we approach it so it's it's bringing the old songs back into to line with the newer sound really mm -hmm. which i think is what steps have been able to do really really well is they've made new records that sound like steps but they sound contemporary mm -hmm. they yeah. don't sound dated they still sound like steps but they sound like steps now so <laughs> my idea was i wanted to make any of their older songs still feel like they could have come off the new album mm. um but the set list is is it, it, there's so much that goes into it i mean there's a bit of it which is you need to do all the hits but you need to do the new songs as well mm -hmm. you start with what you you normally start with what you're going to open with and what you're going to close with hmm. um okay. and then kind of work around and there's also staging things there's costume things what there's certain things where they could be in this incredible costume which is great for one song but it would be weird for another you know if <laughs> right. they were in this beautiful kind of thing and then had to do five six seven eight in it that would be a nightmare <laughs> so um but then in you know i mean I don't know if we get into detail, but on, on, on the last tour, you know, there were very, we, we did it, it was um, set in different time periods. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of what the future holds. So we started, you know, we, so we were in the, you know, we were in the 1800s, then we were in the 60s, and then we were in the future, and then we were now. Right. So mm -hmm. it would be what songs fit within that. And that's why we ended up doing things like in the 60s, we did that kind of delight mash up the kind of the, the yes, five six yes. seven eight and then yeah. we did the um after the love has gone which mm -hmm. was kind of a phil specter girl group right. yes, yes. Um, <laughs> yeah uh, but then that's also why we did in, in what we called the bridgerton section which was mm -hmm. the story of the heart where you make me feel we went quite you know baroque and you know sort of 18 1700s yes so um so that that's that's how it comes but the majority of it I get ma the, the beginning of it is a creative, a visual creative, mm. and then I work from that. So, um, so I, I don't, I never really take the lead on the set list. I just sort of work out. I can, I can sort of decide what I think is going to work and put ideas in, and then sometimes come up with ideas of wouldn't it be good, you know, like the whole idea of doing Better the Devil You Know and Vogue. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. It just felt like it, we were in the nineties. Mm -hmm. Vogue is you know, okay, it's the eighties, but I mean, it felt like, you know, it was <laughs> yeah. it's timeless. Yes. Um, yeah. So that was that. Awesome. Yes, indeed. So, uh, you know, being a little bit of a slang on myself, I was curious to know, um, did you help make the arrangements for the live vocals, such as changing or adding harmonies, ad-libs and other melodic choices? Yeah. I go into vocal rehearsals with them. This is kind of the first thing we do. Yeah, wow. I'm, I'm I, with all the acts I work with, I, I, I kind of do the vocal stuff. And I mean, a lot of it is just a lot of it when it's the record, it's just they do what they do. And there's there's five people in the group and they have their own lines. So you don't ever kind of change that. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, yeah, we, we I'm super proud of, of 
steps as a vocal group you know it's all live vocals mm -hmm. um you know in in the old days um which was fine by then you know there was like those head mics and all that kind yeah. of stuff which which look great but don't sound good so i was pretty adamant at the beginning to say i want everything to be on handheld mics which um. initially didn't go down very well with i'm not sure i don't think but um Ooh. but i'm i'm super proud that they do that um and they're a five-piece harmony group Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, yeah, we, we the very first thing we do before any choreography, before any staging, before anything, we go in for an intense vocal rehearsal. Um, so because the moment that you put other things into it, it's like you're thinking about a million things. Mm -hmm. Whereas I, I really think at the very beginning, get the vocals down so you know exactly what you're doing mm -hmm. and then you don't have to think about it again. So, yeah, I'm, I'm yes, I do. I do get involved in that. Awesome. That's very cool. Yeah, I would say I've been so impressed with the five part harmonies mm. this go around, you know, because we, you know, they didn't sing live very much the first kind of era of steps. So I think hearing all these songs, because mm. I think even in the recordings, you know, we were talking, we just reviewed yeah. the first album and you can't really hear the boys much no. in a lot of the songs and, and it doesn't take full no. advantage of having five vocals. So yeah, it's been really amazing yeah. hearing that live for yeah. sure. Yeah, definitely. I think, and there's, there's, everyone has their own kind of moment and their own kind of feature, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. they've all got, you know, all got their things in there. But I mean, there's that quintessential step sound that every kind of everyone wants as well, mm -hmm. which yeah. is that five part, you know, kind of chorus sound. Yes. Oh, so good. So, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it and it's great. And there's not that many people, you know. It would be very easy. There's a lot of people going around now, touring, and you know, maybe you know not doing everything like mm. you know the, mm -hmm. vocally like that but um yeah we, we're really really proud that, that that's something we do awesome all right so when we revealed to some of the super fans that we would be interviewing you many of them wanted us to yes. show love to the love you more version that you did for party on the dance floor <laughs> and the medley as well yeah so and you're known for putting some amazing yeah. medleys like the one in the kylie showgirl tour so what's your method for putting medleys uh -huh. together and kind of making them come in so seamlessly and then with the different samples of the different songs well i my background a million years ago when i started was um i kind of was a dj and i was doing something back then which was called mega mixing which was like putting, <laughs> just putting stuff so probably the old school version of mashups but you know i'm uh, but i but as a dj i've always had that thing of being able to just i need to you know how to get from one to another mm -hmm. and then because i'm a musician as well a lot of it is the musical segues because what i like to do is i never like that thing where it's like there's a song and then there's a big kind of <laughs> clunk and there's another song <laughs> right. it's got to feel seamless mm -hmm. so there's loads of ways of doing it you always you know there's a way of doing it where you just carry on a little bit of a theme from the previous one to the new one so it seems a bit seamless mm -hmm. um i think in the uh, in the one you mentioned from party on the dance floor love you more that was just a complete let's start from scratch because mm -hmm. i just felt like that we wanted to start the production from scratch on that um but it but again sonically I think it went into You'll Be Sorry, which kind of fit in a similar kind of world. And then mm -hmm. I carried on some production elements from Love You More into You'll Be Sorry. So it. it's about just j gelling things together. The, 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 the Kylie one you mentioned, which was the kind of PWL one, mm -hmm. the idea with that was we don't make it sound like PWL. We almost made it sound like 90s Manchester, mm. Hacienda, Acid House, <laughs> um, and, and put it in that world. Um, so I think really just coming from a, a remix background again, um, it's I find that pretty easy to do um, just to kind of and also when you're in a medley kind of area, you're just picking the best bits because you never really have a thing where you're going to do the whole song because you're trying to compact it. Mm -hmm. So you just pick the, the best bits of each of the songs um, Got it. and and slam them all together. Yeah. Awesome. So is there a full version of the Love You More remix? All the fans want that, no. just FYI. I know you don't have any control no. with releasing it, but oh. okay. No. There you go, everyone. We tried. No, because, <laughs> because, because when I do, that was only ever going to be a medley of mm -hmm. those songs. So I don't go in and do and spend a whole bunch of time making a full right. version of something only to cut it down. Yeah. So I'm sorry to disappoint, but uh, <laughs> there is not. <laughs> Noted. Aww. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> so you're known for your creative and unexpected uses of samples and interpolations. And we will get into the specifics of all of that for the uh, What the Future Holds tour very soon. But since you mentioned that you did have a DJ background, what else goes into your process for sourcing relevant and innovative re references? Um, it can be sometimes it, it's again, I think it's like a sound thing. I think mm. but with steps, I, you never I don't ever reinvent the wheel. I mean, some, OK, sometimes it has gone a bit crazy, but <laughs> it's like the, the song has to stay. You know, mm -hmm. the, the most important thing is that the audience can still sing the song. You don't. You, the last thing you want is for someone to go to a show and go, oh, I love that song, but they really ruined it. I couldn't sing along mm. to it and I couldn't dance to it. You know, it's horrible when that happens. And I don't want that. So um, so I always just say it's more about embellishing it. So it, again, mm. it, and, and I kind of go back to what I said before about you're just putting it in a different world. So you're you're putting you know that into if, again devil is a really good example and, and, and it's a weird one for me because it's a song that i've done a few times for kylie so right. Right. i'm always very <laughs> conscious of making sure that i don't double up in in that um <laughs> but it it really because the original of better the devil you know it's, it's really is the kylie's is a big stock economic waterman 80s song mm -hmm. um but then on, on this tour I, because we were in this kind of 90s late 80s 90s world um i just thought i've, I've got a, a huge love for a remixer producer called shep pettibone who who did who produced vogue mm. and um and he used to do loads of remixes and he was so inspirational i thought well why don't we put him in that world which wasn't a million miles away from the my old sort of remix team of brothers in rhythm that i used to be in and we were kind of very much in that world as well so um it's like sonic i suppose is the way to do it is like finding the sonic stuff as far as the mashups and throwing things in and stuff that can that can literally be oh wouldn't it be fun if we did this mm. um and they don't always come from me either so for instance in um the in the most recent tour putting the um which was actually quite uh, amazingly kind of just done again um by beyonce which was like redoing the vogue rap with different yes. names mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so so when we did it it was with like 90s pop stars and then obviously beyonce did it with someone else but um but that was an idea of you know the band and, and the creative director had that idea and then we just ran with it oh, okay. so we accept like it, it's it's a team we all work with incredibly talented amazing people and it's a massive melting pot, basically. So you have worked on a few steps tours, including the arena ones, but also all the summer shows that they've done over the years. Yes. So now that you've worked yes. with them and have interpreted their songs in a couple different ways, are there any specific yes. arrangements that you're the most proud of from across the tours? Um, I am, there's lots actually, but I'll try and keep it to short. <laughs> um, I mean, I love, uh, I, 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 I really, the one I wanted to get my hands on more than anything else was one for sorrow because of that hearing it the first time. And I just mm -hmm. knew that I wanted to turn it into a, mm. like a symphony. Um, and it's like, so, I mean, ridiculously over the top, everything that's like the kitchen sink, <laughs> bells, whistles, glitter, <laughs> the, the world is on that. And it was big anyway. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but the one that I'm, I'm, I'm super, I really, really loved was we did a version of um, Heartbeat on the last tour, yes. which we just stripped right back to piano and orchestra. Mm -hmm. And I love that song. It's just always one of my favorite step songs. And um, and there's this really cool moment. There was kind of a mistake, actually, but I love it when these things happen where it gets to the end of the middle eight and, you know, Claire's just done this massive mm -hmm. Celine Dion moment. <laughs> and it's like, oh, my God. And it just drops to an actual single heartbeat. Mm. And and, yes. and at the time I was arranging it and I got to that point and I went to play piano and I had the wrong track. I wasn't selected or something. And it just hit the heartbeat in the chorus. And I was like, oh my God, that's it. It was a total mistake. But when it happened, and then I, I had a secondary thing where I thought they are coming back after two years mm. of, you know, of being away and people not being able to go to shows mm -hmm. right. and for them to sing you were only a heartbeat away to their audience to make them realize that they were thinking about them the whole time I just thought that was really poignant mm -hmm. so I just let it happen and mm -hmm. then brought everything back in for the last chorus so uh, mostly what I do nine times out of ten c comes from an emotional place um, via a musical place but I always think about 
the lyric and what it would mean and and how that dynamic would work and and also how it would sit in in any venue because you know mm -hmm. it's a, the arenas are big and you're trying to get across to sometimes fifteen thousand people mm -hmm. so you, you need to you know you, you we put a lot of thought into that to make sure that people are engaged oh yeah definitely i think i think when it when it when the music did follow it i was like oh my god it's just one heartbeat so, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, and then you get those again you get this harmony and you know as a singer yourself yeah. like you get those harmonies you get that yeah. amazing mm -hmm. thing and then and and sometimes for someone like me that is reasonably well known for like throwing everything at everything <laughs> and making it the biggest thing possible like especially in the intros and stuff for shows to have a moment where it's just a heartbeat and and vocals and then you listen to the lyric and then mm. you know the world explodes and everything comes in again so yeah. so yeah i i loved that and i and i did i really loved um we did a like a phil specter wine house after the love's gone on this tour, yes. which mm -hmm. was super fun oh can't wait to talk so, about that one but then also <laughs> on one of the summer shows which nobody <laughs> really got to see i'm a, i don't think we did vu vu by abba which i loved oh yes as the intro to stomp right <laughs> Saw some fan yeah, fans yeah. with that, yes. yes. It was like a video only interlude for Voulez Vu, but we had a lot of fun with that. Oh, so, awesome. Yeah. Oh, that's, ooh. Okay, I love the outsourcing I know, no, it doesn't exist, and there isn't a full version. <laughs> <laughs> Let me say Good now. call, good call. <laughs> that's amazing. But um, uh, So, speaking of songs and just the, I guess, the library you have in your brain <laughs> what songs have been the most mm. challenging to interpret for the themes chosen throughout the shows and and then putting them into contemporary soundscape like what has been really challenging to like put together or like oh i don't know if this is going to work and it's like wow this works <laughs> one song can you guess what it is five six seven eight <laughs> yes oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was tough it was the one that i feared the most oh. um when we did the, the party on the dance floor because well, because famously they hadn't done it like mm. on the previous tours um pre <laughs> me getting involved it had been like a video interlude or I mean, they just run away from it mm -hmm. yes. and i understand that but but audiences love it they mm -hmm. love that song yeah and um but i i was fearful of it because i was like i don't really know how we can I don't know what to do. I literally, I was a bit flummoxed and I, what, just, like, I don't know what to do with this. It's like, it's a, what do you do? And then Frank and I sat down and had a chat as we do and said, why don't we go like the most nutty, crazy <laughs> country barn dance, mental techno <laughs> version that you possibly can. And then I had this idea of there's, um, a film a Baz Luhrmann film called Strictly Ballroom mm -hmm. and in it they, they there's a scene with a Paso Doble and they start kind of slow and then they speed up and they speed up and speed up and so like, well, why why don't we put it in that kind of Mexican world mm -hmm. of the Paso Doble with the guitars and ting 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 ding, 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 that thing yeah. uh -huh. speed up speed up speed up and then when it goes it just goes crazy with like like proper country fiddles and you know cajun guitars and you know so that's what we did that time and then the second it was like once you've done that and you've done the biggest version of it ever it's like well now what do you do mm -hmm. so the second time round, there was this whole idea because we were in the 60s we kind of were thinking about that austin powers type you yes. know vibe <laughs> um and then we and then frank strachan not me frank said that Groove is in the Heart by Delight, which is a 90s song that has that Austin Powers vibe. Mm -hmm. So like, would they work? And my, my immediate reaction to Frank was, no, <laughs> no absolutely. Because the, the, the chords, like, as a, like mus musically, and you, for like, from a musical point of view, you might get this, that they don't quite work. And it was like, oh, it doesn't, mm. it's, you, and then I started to do it and change it and move it. And, and then I sent something to him and I said, what do you mean like this? And he was like, yes, exactly like that. So that, and then, and even when we played it to the band, they were like, oh, we're not sure, is it, is it, are people going to, like, are they going to like, it's, oh, I'm not sure. And then once the choreography was done, mm -hmm. it was like, yes, mm -hmm. this is amazing. Um, and then when, for the summer shows this year, I've just gone back to the original 
but really almost EDM'd it up, basically. Okay. Gone really tough on the drums. Nice. And it sounds like this mega version of it now for the summer shows. Awesome. So, yeah. So that's my answer every time. (laughs) That's the one that has stumped me. But so far, so good. Nice. Gonna have to start brainstorming for the next tour in a few years. (laughs) Oh, my God. (laughs) I think it'll go back to it'll go back to a video interlude for the right, next right. time. <laughs> with the giant heads. Yes. Or a dancer interlude, yes. Yeah. All right. So but yes, the focus yes. of today's conversation is the What the Future Holds tour, which took place in the fall of twenty twenty one around the UK, right when mm-hmm. Omicron was also starting its world tour. And yeah, I was still lucky it. enough to be able to fly to London and attend the two O2 Arena shows and again oh, was just blown away by the music arrangements. So, so we'd you love saw, to Yeah. So you saw for one night and for the next night. Exactly. Right? Yes. You never saw all five. Never saw we all lost five. One and then we got one back and then we lost another one. Yep. Oh, never gosh. saw all five. But it was pretty awesome kind of, you know, back to back seeing two basically completely different shows. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, we'd love to go act by act and dive a little deeper into each section. Yeah. Absolutely. And and just before we do, what I would say, and you'll see this on the um the the film show that's coming out and mm-hmm. the, the documentary as well it was lots of people at that time were not going out because it was a bit too scary and they yeah. were worried about whether or not people would come and stuff and i'm so incredibly proud of this band that they bit the bullet and said yeah we're going to go because it mm. was really really tough for them i mean they went from you know they went from hotel room to dressing room to stage to dressing room to hotel mm-hmm. room couldn't see anybody they were in a bubble of you know six seven people i don't know if you noticed but our dancers all the dancers were um separated on stage as well right Mm -hmm. so they didn't it was you know socially distanced choreography as well so it was taking every 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 precaution we could wow so um it was an amazing tour but it was a lot yes (laughs) yeah but yeah go for it yeah go for it so the overall theme of the show was a trip through time, and it all started with Act One, which took us to the future, 3021. Yeah. <laughs> and in Act One, the future 3021 featured What the Future Holds, One for Sorrow, Heartbreak in the City, Neon Blue, and Take Me for a Ride. So how do you navigate the start of a concert? Like you mentioned, the beginning and the end are the important bits. So how in the world did you yeah. have such an amazing, dramatic build for this song? I mean, like blew our minds (laughs) i saw some of the principal visuals Mm. and of what it was going to be i knew it was going to be that kind of future thing and i just thought marvel Mm -hmm. modern day marvel superheroes yeah Yeah. so i felt like it needed that kind of hans zimmer type batman you know real thing to it and and just we'd done on the last tour i'd done a thing with lots of kind of quite sinister sounding choirs and stuff like that so i wanted this to be quite electronic i was also really inspired by i don't know if you know a series called westworld yes oh, yeah. um but so season three of westworld um went very much in that kind of future area um and i love um the composer of that as well um, so I was in very much in that West world meets meets kind of the again the Hans Zimmer thing um, and June I think as well that kind of mm. the, the more modern film of June yeah I felt like yes. that desolate soundscape um, so I just put all those influences into my brain and I honestly I'd, I'd love to explain how it works but I just sit and play and play and play until something starts sounding good and then i just fill it up but i knew it had to have an opening section and it had to and i knew what was going to happen with this thing where this square was going to come down Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden they were going to be revealed underneath it um so um it it, it, yeah it needed to have two two big sections to it and also my principal thing on any intro for any show is you've got to you you know you want to rile the crowd up you want to get there yeah you want to get them ready because the moment that, you know, if you think about when people go to a concert and when you guys go to concerts, mm-hmm. you've, you've months before you've spent time getting tickets, you've mm-hmm. 
worked out what you're going to do you've worked out what you're going to wear you've worked mm -hmm. out where to eat and and you get in there and you've been waiting and waiting and waiting to see it and it's mm -hmm. like it's such a magical thing that can happen mm -hmm. so the moment that you see these people that you adore it's i want it to be like the best feeling in the world mm -hmm. so um so i really love that kind of build and reveal um so yeah that's where we and then obviously it had to whatever i did had to go into future and i knew that we had to start with a chorus of future because mm -hmm. the single doesn't it goes straight into the verse yeah and i just that it had to start with which for claire was tricky because it's really high and it's the first thing she sings <laughs> yeah. but you know i remember saying it and she's like oh thanks thanks for that. <laughs> but it's just like you know but starting with that drowning in our history thing was mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah. was really punchy i thought mm -hmm. so yeah that's that's how i started that one awesome and then kind of actually going before that i've always wondered the pre the pre show songs that play do you have any hand in yep. that or the artist choose those songs and then there yep. was kind of like the countdown happening too no, that... so do you actually play a role in that yeah so um not for everyone but for my, well, most of the people i work with i get a bit um it's the old it's the dj in me i'm afraid <laughs> i get a bit kind of control freak over because i think it really <laughs> makes a difference like how you how yeah. and, we, and we were so lucky because obviously you came to our show so uh, came to their show so you saw that we had um sophie ellis bexter who was yes. brilliant um and so she'd really warm the crowd up but mm -hmm. um i love a i love a crowd that are in for steps i love a crowd that are in the mood for a party mm -hmm. you know so firstly i did that but yeah frank had this fantastic idea of every i think it was every well it started off at like i think it was 60 45 30 15 10 5 or whatever mm -hmm. there'd be a little blast of a step song mm. and a kind of a countdown and it, it got everyone ready but also it made sure that everyone would was going to be in the arena at the time yeah actually mm -hmm. so it was quite a smart thing to do um so no one was out getting a drink when it started um but yeah i i do yeah there's a few in there and i and and it's really great as well because you look around i think on the i don't know if it was on this night but like it's amazing you just see like i think I, we put um I think I put uh, single ladies in there mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you just get the, the most unlikely people doing the most incredible <laughs> dance routines in the audience. Um, and then you, you know, and then my, my winner, my always guaranteed 100% winner is Man I Feel Like a Woman by Shania Twain. Mm. Yes. Which everybody knows. Mm -hmm. So, you know, once you've got that in there, everyone's ready for a party. Mm -hmm. so, awesome. uh, so yeah, I do. I do get involved in that. Awesome. <laughs> cool. So in the rest of the section, it's mostly newer songs from the Steps catalog. So we noticed that some yeah. songs, mostly the older ones, do get kind of a full revamp. But the newer ones, you do stay true, truer to the original studio versions. Yeah, well, so... because I think, yeah, because they've just come out. So I mean, mm -hmm. I don't think, you know, we. I don't tend to go, I mean, obviously, Sorrow was a was kind of a, a kind of version of the one of my mm -hmm. arrangement of Sorrow anyway. Um, but yeah, Heartbreak Neon and Take Me Off a Ride, they, they've only really been out not very long. Mm -hmm. And I don't change things for the sake of changing things. And yeah. also the production on them, you know, you're talking about the alias of so one of the best pop production teams in the world. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm not messing with any of them. Yeah. <laughs> Especially with steps where they don't have a live band. Do you have to do yeah. Do you do, do anything kind of more subtly to elevate the songs for the stage? Or, or yeah. do you really just kind of take I, I do that? do that yeah i do do that sometimes i will there will be something um i think i might have done it on take me for a ride actually where it sounds great as a record but in an arena it just might need an extra kick an extra mm -hmm. something you know an extra normally it's like dynamics really or it might just need the chorus might sound amazing on the radio but it might just feel a bit go over run a bit flat mm -hmm. so yeah i do we spend an awful long time because obviously I run our show on 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 stems, so it's mm -hmm. not just like yeah. a, a an instrumental or something. It's also right. so we spend right. a lot of time on dynamics to make sure that it doesn't feel like you're just listening to a CD. So yeah, I I, I do do quite a lot of that. Oh, awesome, awesome, yeah, seriously. <laughs> all right, so in Act Two, we find ourselves in the '60s, and it all starts with a video interlude showcasing each group member singing some '60s classics, like Lisa with "Baby Love" and Claire with "You're My World." So, how was the process choosing these songs and recording them? I asked them, really. Um, we just, I, I said, 
we knew we were doing the 60s thing we wanted to make it look like that kind of ready steady go kind of tv show <laughs> mm -hmm. um and there's so much to choose from i just said i think i said i think frank and i would have said something like let us know what you love here's a couple of suggestions so i think mm -hmm. we might have put a couple just because otherwise it's like you've got the whole of the 60s what do you pick mm -hmm. um and and they kind of pretty much i think they were all they were all their choices actually they all came back and said they had that one they were like oh this is my karaoke song or you know this is like this is one of my it's just a song like my mum loved or something like that mm -hmm. so you know and they picked i mean h is i i was really happy he did it's not unusual because tom is welsh h is welsh mm -hmm. it's so cool isn't it? lee's one is unbelievable lee is so cool in, <laughs> yes. on wild thing mm -hmm. oh my god it just looks amazing claire's claire's loved you're my world forever mm -hmm. phased massive dusty fan uh yeah. and lisa loves the supremes so yeah that's what we did awesome and then how does it work legally do you do you have to clear it for these tours or do you even have to deal with that or is that someone else on the team <laughs> i have <laughs> not my department <laughs> good for you good that's it's a mess we used to both do that professionally for labels and publishing companies so that's not it's not fun no. i can promise you <laughs> yes, yes yes no i i just <laughs> I just do the music bit and then then <laughs> give it to someone else to have the headache. Right. Awesome. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> so the songs in this section were five, six, seven, eight. After the love is gone, something in your eyes, say you'll be mine, and chain reaction. So we talked a little bit about the five, six, mm. seven, eight mashup and the new version of After the Love Is Gone. But for me, one of the big highlights for the latter was that key change uh, that you added um, to After oh, the Love Is Gone. Yeah. So how did that come about? Because you made it even higher for Claire. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, I, I I didn't actually. I lowered the first oh. part, oh. so the key changes in the original. Good for you. you go. I'm looking smart. at the singer. I'm looking at the singer there, going, <laughs> yes. Yes. "Yes, there you go." <laughs> I'm kind to singers. Thank you. I'm super kind to singers. Thanks. Not. Do you know what? I mean, I did think about not doing that just to kind of annoy her because we've got that kind of relationship. <laughs> but um, but no. Well, actually, but it's actually very very difficult because. Um, for Faye, it's really difficult because Faye's got mm -hmm. the low harmony, which is really oh, low yeah. anyway. Yeah. And that just shows you the, the incredible range of Faye Toza Smith, who's just unreal. Um, but yeah, so she, where, where Claire is in the verse, she's under that. And it's super, super oh, low. Oh my gosh, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but I, to be fair, I could have done it the other way, but I'm very, very conscious of the fact that this is a tour mm. and this has got to happen every night and it's very different. Like mm -hmm. there's nothing, there's nothing Claire Richards can't sing. Absolutely nothing. And yes. if she would have done it, but mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm kind. So yeah, but I felt <laughs> it. And the funny thing is, is I put a little gap into yes. key change, which mm -hmm. I loved. But of course, what I completely, and this is where I love audiences because they always surprise me. Nobody knew I was going to do that. So they all just come in in the gap. And, yes. um, and then they're even more surprised. Yeah, of course they do. And they're even more surprised when the key change comes in. But it just felt like if it was in the 60s and if it was, mm -hmm. you know, something out of that world, it would, of course, it would have a, heat cha a key yeah. change. Oh, yeah. And just allowed me to add even more strings. But um, yeah, I wanted to go, for, yeah, Phil Spector meets Mark Ronson is where I was aiming. Nice. Oh yeah, totally so. got that. I was sitting there like, why does this feel like the Ronettes? He's like, ah, I'm yeah, ask him. Totally the Ronettes. Okay, good. I was like, oh That's my god. That's what we wanted. Good. I was like, Phil's crazy, Tip. but damn, this Amazing. is so good. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, Phil's, <laughs> Phil's a little cuckoo. But I was like, oh, this is so good. Oh god. <laughs> but, um, but also, yeah. what what was interesting was if you think about the Ronettes thing as well, mm. in the timing of of after love has gone, is love has gone. Mm -hmm. So it's going, 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 dang. Yeah. It's, that's how my brain worked when they said after love's gone is in the 60s the first thing my brain said was that timing that drum beat i can hear the whole thing amazing so, that was definitely so, a highlight for yes, sure yes yes <laughs> and and speaking of vocals and such um did you get involved with the live mixing for the shows like are levels constantly being adjusted to account for the leads and backing vocals are, are there is there automation because like we meant like he mentioned actually we don't hear it really on the, the album in the earlier days but now we're hearing everything i was like oh my god i hear the boys mm. i hear them so did you have any hand in that uh well only that um there's a guy called jonathan digby who's mm. their front of house mix engineer for for both the shows all of the shows i've been involved with and he he's meticulous mm. on stuff like that he's got if you ever stood behind him in the, on a desk he's got uh 
lyrics with kind of color coded lyrics of who's mm. singing, what's doing like that. I mean, the majority of his show is spent with the kind of making like getting the leads done because when you've got five again as a singer you'll appreciate this when you've got five live vocals there's a bit where someone's going to sing a lead and then but then they're on a harmony but they're going to be singing at the same volume i mean we can do a little bit with that but also for a live for live vocals again as you'll know you don't want people to be too far off the mic because of all the other noise that comes down it mm -hmm. so um so i he, he has references kind of from me of my studio versions to say what well, kind of this is how it sits mm -hmm. um but then it's that it's down to him he's he's absolutely brilliant and and i all i will do if i ever do anything is i will sit and i will advise if i need to be or i will kind of jump in um when it came to the live show for the for the film show that's going to be released then mm -hmm. i mixed all the audio for that yeah oh my gosh awesome. that's awesome yeah. oh you know speaking yeah. of mixing and such we we've noticed that there was some 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 drumming for chain reaction. So how did that idea for the marching band drumline version come to be? Because I was thinking 60s, is this like a Brit 60s thing? Like, so culturally, does that fit into what was happening in, in the UK, I guess? I was well, just like, where is this? <laughs> no, nah, well, I think we I think we stretched it a bit. Um, I think oh, the okay. fact was chain reaction. Mm -hmm. Chain reaction felt like a Motown song. It was originally a Diana Ross song. Mm -hmm. we, you know, sometimes we just like bend it a little bit. Um, so, um, but I think it was Claire's original idea of like, oh, wouldn't it be great if we could do have some drums and do like a drum oh. solo? Um, yeah. But as with everything with steps, we don't they, they don't do anything by half, so they took it very seriously. I had my Tom Meadows, the drummer in, in Kylie's band, mm -hmm. came to the rehearsal, taught them oh. how to do it. So they're at, they're doing it on stage. <laughs> yeah, and I, yeah. Yeah, and I taught them the rhythm, taught them what to do. You know, we had to figure out how best to do it to get them back there. To kind of do that to be able to put the sticks down and come back mm -hmm. but um yeah no we just thought and also because it fitted that rhythm that kind of triplet mm -hmm. rhythm of chain reaction that ding, 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 that kind yeah. of thing it just kind of fitted dynamically really well and it was another way of putting nice dynamics in it but i i really loved that bit because they really go for it i mean yeah. you saw it yourself yeah. like when they're at the back they really go for it and it's like really cool but um as you can tell from my background it's a bit muppets <laughs> and i love that do you yes. know what i mean yes. <laughs> it was a fun twist it was a yeah. fun twist i was just like huh is this something we have to ask yeah. him <laughs> <laughs> yeah yes. yeah yeah but it was the band it was it was yeah it was definitely it all came from the band and it was just like mm. and the thing is with us is i i kind of say in shows i have this expression which is like we play with live ammo which is like if someone says just something we say yeah sure yes. mm -hmm. like if you're going to put it in the room expect it to be tried yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, oh, and there's that. never and there's never a, a, an idea too crazy not to try awesome. so we're up for it cool all right so moving on to act three which was the 1600s or the bridgerton act as you mentioned <laughs> yeah. it started with a video interlude of story of a heart then went into it's the way you make me feel the slightest touch a hundred years of winter last thing on my mind stomp and heartbeat so you made yeah. orchestral mixes of story of a heart and it's the mm -hmm. way you make me feel and then we kind of transitioned into like a disco 70s moment for the slightest touch through to stomp so mm -hmm. the transition did feel very seamless and all the songs still fit really well together so what was your methodology with the orchestral versions and how did you keep everything in this section sonically cohesive i mean i think it's, it's you know the fact that i think we we were so the whole bridgerton thing i think there was even a thing that flashed up before that said yes. steps flicks yes i don't know if you saw that, <laughs> that so amazing. i mean <laughs> we were being we weren't being subtle about bridgerton at all um, <laughs> and i love Bridgerton. i love i love the music i love how the i think it's so cool how um they've done the music for Bridgerton and they've taken modern songs and kind of put that, you know, the, the vitamin string quartet that did mm -hmm. the original Bridgerton stuff. And mm -hmm. So, yeah, and it felt like it was going to be, you know, we knew what the costumes were going to be. We knew what the world was going to be. Plus, mm -hmm. any time that there's a segue, I mean, the only, the main reason that there are any of these segues is because it's costume changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you guys saw the costumes that they came out in. Yes. These are not easy costumes to get out of what they were in and into this yeah. in a very very short amount of time yeah. you know so we have to kind of keep people interested so you know we had the couple on uh, you know that were on the stage of the dancers mm -hmm. um but yeah i just i just felt it needed to be as every as often with me I, it was gonna meant to just be a string quartet but of course it turned into like a symphony orchestra by the end mm -hmm. um and 
and I love Story of a Heart. It's such a great song. Yes. It's got that, you know, sort of ABBA connection as well. So I think that into Way You Make Me Feel, I, I, I wanted to do, I'd never really done Way You Make Me Feel. We did it as an mm. acoustic version or something, but yes. um, I love that song and I wanted to kind of bring, uh, even though it sounds like the original, the sounds in it are kind of much more contemporary. And I thought, sort of thought, well, what would, you know, almost Max Martin do with this today mm-hmm. um, in the realm of sounds. So, and, and Way You Make Me Feel has got a lot of strings on it anyway. So those two were really, really easy. To be honest with you, slightest touch, I didn't do anything. That is the, um, so the so John Dixon, who is an amazing, amazing producer to remix, uh, who's, uh, who goes under Seventh Heaven. Um, that's his version mm-hmm. and it's extraordinary. And I didn't touch it because he's <laughs> the best. Yes. <laughs> so um, yeah, and then again, Winter, Hundred Years of Winter, I did do a bit of a, it's an amalgamation of kind of the album version and my friend James Wiltshire um, was in Freemasons and is now F9 mm-hmm. and um, so his version. So I did a kind of amalgamation of the two, um, which worked really, really well. Uh, and then last thing in my mind, uh, from what I remember, started as an acapella. Yes. yes. So um, and then the, then we just went and then it was so it was started as a sing along with the crowd, which I thought was really cool. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. That we haven't don't think they've done that much before um yeah and then that went into like the you know classic steps version yes um beefed up a bit again because <laughs> uh, everyone loves that uh stomp was very much my arrangement that i'd done before probably just truncated a bit um because mm. it still it still sounded great and then yeah ending on heartbeat which we have already talked about with the mm-hmm. orchestra and yeah. the heartbeat and the desperately trying to make people cry <laughs> <laughs> desperately trying <laughs> <laughs> I was almost there. Which, um, <laughs> which we achieved. Yeah. Not you. Didn't get you. Okay, right. Well, <laughs> next time. She wasn't in the okay, room. You know, I'll find yeah. It got me. It got me. Oh. Yeah, was, when, you, was... when you watch the when you watch the when you watch the film show, just remember what I said about everyone being away from each other for so long. Yes. Yeah. That'll get you. So you did have which is interesting, like one like ballad moment the piano yes. but after that there really wasn't anything that had any kind of like i guess poignant moment that was just very just a stark contrast from the dancing and the and the go 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 so are there any other step songs that you mm. think could have worked in a similar way broken down without any percussion um i did a version of heartbreaking the city um mm. that was an acoustic version Mm-hmm. that I don't think was right for, in fact, I think we talked about doing it for this show and it wasn't right for the show. I think apart from Heartbeat, we were very conscious that people had been inside for a long time and they mm-hmm. wanted to dance. Yes. So it wasn't a time, we had one moment of poignant reflection and then it was like, let's get back on the dance floor. Nice. Um, but there are a lot of, I think there's a, quite a lot of step songs that would work really, really well as, mm-hmm. as ballads or, or, yeah. or sort of orchestral versions yeah. Yeah. Um, because they're so well written. Mm-hmm. Yes. So I think really, yeah, I think you, you can take, you take, I mean, I did do a piano version of Deeper Shade of Blue with Claire um, on her own in years, like 10 years ago, which mm. was, I think it was released actually. And that sound, that's gorgeous. And we did also, we did a, when for Claire's tour, after I made the record with her, mm-hmm. we did a kind of half, half speed, almost country one for Sorrow, oh. um, which worked really, really well. So yeah, I think that I think pretty much all of them would would work really really well in it because they really work. They're great songs. Yes, awesome. Apart from five, six, seven, eight, <laughs> <laughs> that'd be a challenge for sure. Yeah, it's funny. I I always I still listen to Abbey Road sessions, Kylie's, and I was like, Steps mm. could totally do an Abbey Road sessions. That would really work. They could totally do an Abbey Road yeah. sessions. Yes, wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? Yes, yes. let's put it out there. <laughs> Manifest. Manifest. Yes. yes. <laughs> all right. So moving on to Act Four, we go to nineteen ninety nine. And it started with the yeah. Better the Devil You Know Vogue mashup, Love's Got a Hold of My Heart, Summer of Love, Better Best Forgotten, and Deeper Shade of Blue. Um, so we already talked about Better the Devil You Know, um, but for Summer of Love, it does have this major salsa facelift. So how did that come about? And what are some of the elements that you needed to add to, to take us to Ibiza? I'm, just, uh, I'm so enjoying major salsa, major salsa facelift. That should have been my... Uh... I should have really, I think I, 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 I'll, I'll get onto that. I, I just, I've just remembered as well. The thing that was really cool about that section is it started off with a video interlude of To the Beat of My Heart. Yes. Mm-hmm. That I've mixed and made it sound like a 90s rave record. Mm-hmm. And at the front of it, it's got 
um it's got them so we recorded them there's like it's all this old video footage of them when they yes. first started mm -hmm. it's quite emotional actually but um but then we got we kind of recorded them doing their as if they were back then doing you know hi we're steps and they yeah. used to do that thing where they had to introduce each other it was like i'm faye i do this i'm faye. yeah, so yeah. That was so much fun recording yes. that at the beginning to put it over the thing and i remember the first time they saw it and i think it was all from h's video um library mm -hmm. and it was it was so emotional them watching themselves back after what was then you know 23 years mm -hmm. right. um and they hadn't actually really seen each other that much either in the, because of what had been going on so but yes as far as going back to the the salsa thing um that is that came from as so often um comes from choreography mm -hmm. and uh and and we knew that we needed to well frank wanted to put after love's got a hold of my heart frank wanted to put a countdown because we i'm sure that people don't really notice this but we were going from 1999 to 2000. oh yes no yes yes okay good brilliant <laughs> gold star gold yeah. star amazing <laughs> but um but we never know whether people get it or not but um yeah. yeah so we went into the summer of love thing and then it was like yeah we need to do a a massive because it, it feels like a like a fiesta that whole song mm -hmm. doesn't it right it just feels yeah. like that piano thing and you know with they have been been in strictly come strictly come dancing mm -hmm. and it just felt like the right thing to do just go samba latin fiesta madness mm -hmm. yeah um, that was great <laughs> so yeah it was really enjoyable actually it was uh yeah it was a fun that was a fun one to play as well so because you don't you don't often get cool to do that kind of playing <laughs> but, um, but yeah it was definitely it. fun it was definitely fun for sure and um it was it was interesting watching it because again you went from like you know tss, 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 you know and then yeah. suddenly there was like this dubstepy kind of trap dance breakdown and then i will survive interpolation and deeper shades of blue and deeper shade of blue and i was sitting there like wait are those the strings from i will survive but they just did a hip-hop breakdown so it really took me yeah. by surprise and they're both <laughs> different vibes right so when you're arranging these kinds of versions of songs do you compose the new elements in your head like oh yeah this is gonna be hot or do you like kind of experiment with some like sample libraries until something clicks um the this sort of trap breakdown in Deep Shadow of Blue was something Mark, choreography, Mark mm. asked for. Okay. Because um, okay. he had an idea of what he wanted to do with the dancers, um, which again, I obliged. I'm absolutely happy to do that. Mm -hmm. The string line, the basically the chords for Deeper Shade are the same, pretty much the same chords as, mm -hmm. as I was to buy. So it just was one of those things I heard yes. and I thought, oh, yeah, that all, that oh. fits. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but you see, I don't really ever think that it's interesting how you say that. I don't really think that because I've, you know, I know what you're saying because like, I've just gone to some. I'm in a kind of modern club world, then I'm in a kind of weird sort of trap world, yeah. and then I'm in back in the disco. It doesn't it was, really. I never really think of it like that. It was. It's like, is it? Does it work? Yeah, yeah exactly. That's what it felt like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you get away from stuff like that because the songs are so good and the band is so good. Yeah. Um. So yeah, and then there was just that we had to add this mad ending on because I think the. Uh, <laughs> we had to get them off stage basically mm -hmm. yeah so yeah so then there was the technology of trying to get that to work but oh, uh, yeah. yeah it was a good ending actually it was yeah fun. oh yes yes <laughs> definitely all right so now here we are at act five the present day uh, well as present yeah. as the day was back then 2021 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> with here and now scare the dark and tragedy <laughs> so here and now got a yeah. brand new Sometimes. modern remix so what production choices were made to make it feel fresh um the again we needed a, a good intro um because they were completely changing again mm -hmm. uh into something <laughs> completely different um so again it was one of those ones where i wanted to get it was almost like another intro for a show really just to, to bring it up um i i'd never i'd never worked on here and now mm -hmm. before and i always loved the song but um the original just felt i mean we could have probably got away with it because of how cool that 2000s pop is now you know yeah. that kind of max britney sound yes it just felt a bit weird mm. to end with that um and again i wanted i felt it was very uplifting so i just thought let's go in sort of 2022 club land <laughs> keep it nice and uplifting it's major chords mm -hmm. so it was going to make it it was going to be really smiley um and they wanted to have a 
a kind of a poignant message over it. So there's a bit where they've each got a, a, a vocal before they start singing. Mm -hmm. um, originally, it, we did a little more of it originally, um, but it just felt like it had done it because it had such a long intro. By the time it had got to the second chorus, it felt like it was done. So we ended up just chopping it down slightly mm -hmm. and just going. We always had this idea that the encore shouldn't stop. Mm -hmm. The encore should just be like a medley. It should just be like yes, the end yes. of the best disco you've ever been to in your life. And um, so, yeah, I remember we made that choice to go right. Once we start, we don't stop. Yes. Nice. Yeah, the energy was really high. Yeah, that was a really great moment yeah. in the arena. Yeah, and there's this kind of, there's a really interesting thing that happens where there's a... Th because everything's everyone knows tragedy is going to happen at some point mm -hmm. yeah. so you just keep teasing it so there's like a thunderclap before scared of the dark where people think that's going to be tragedy but it isn't uh. and then it's like so you're there so by the time tragedy hits you're just fit to burst right you've just right. you know you're ready to go you're ready you're like you know it's coming you know it's coming yes. um and then it just kind of delivers so again the whole long call was just trying to keep it very modern club um scared i added a bunch of stuff into that i hadn't done before because it needed in an encore it needed more even mm -hmm. though it's the biggest standing record in the world it mm. just needed extra strings extra stuff yes. more yes. of yes <laughs> yes more one. of more stuff mm -hmm. um and then and then tragedy is i mean that version is pretty much the version that i in you know, my my version of it um mm -hmm. i added a few extra things but um it just it just does the job that song doesn't it yes oh, yeah. i think well, we have to mention of course your versions of tragedy and a few other tracks are included on the deluxe version of the platinum collection so <laughs> the fans are very very excited about that and yes the church bells and tragedy that it it's just yeah. awesome that was just such an amazing moment for sure well it was when we when they asked about putting it on the platinum i thought do i just make a kind of more DJ friendly intro mm -hmm. or something. And I was like, no, it's like the tour version. And mm -hmm. and I'm so delighted that they've been released because I, I a lot of times I get asked um, from lots of people that I work with to kind of uh, for, for tour versions and for various things for lots of my acts. And, and, and it's really sweet and I really love it, but I can't do it. I don't, I can't, mm -hmm. I don't leak anything. I'd never work again if I did. So I don't own anything. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I don't, it's not, yeah. doesn't belong to me. I do the arrangement, but it's not, it then becomes theirs. Right. So for them to, to, to include some tour versions and, and as, as the steps 25 revisited, it's really great. It's lovely. Mm -hmm. Like even this morning, just hearing people, especially the people that have got the digital download yes um as part of that package and they got after love's gone that they weren't even expecting mm -hmm. yeah. so you know i'm really really happy i'm i'm really overjoyed that they because i when i do tour versions you know those are the versions that the choreographer gets the lighting guy mm -hmm. gets you know that right. i make them sound like records they're not just like roughs they are right. proper remixes yeah. so um it's so nice that they don't just exist on my computer now which is wonderful the DVD, though officially recorded yes. and filmed on the second night at the O2 Arena when Lee was missing, does have both the video and audio footage of him included, and it yeah, blended in, in like really greatly. So, how was it navigating how to include him in the edit, and how did you go about making it all happen? The uh, yeah, the, the sort of CGI industrial light and magic um, <laughs> moments. Well, no. So what it was was um, we filmed both nights mm -hmm. and it is it is from both nights mm -hmm. so there are there it's not one night it's from oh you know there are there are moments that are from different things but it would be so wrong to have a steps show without a member mm -hmm. in it um we have the footage we recorded um everything we multi-tracked everything mm -hmm. um it was a bit of a jigsaw puzzle mm -hmm. um but once we put it all together, it's seamless and mm -hmm. yeah. you can enjoy the step show that that you didn't get to see at all and <laughs> you didn't get to see as five. Yes. You'll get to finally see it as five. Um, and it felt absolutely the right thing. It would be ridiculous to not even consider doing that. Yeah. Um, I'm so I'm so thrilled with how it's turned out as well. It looks I'm so happy with how it sounds. I'm so happy with how it looks. The documentary is really, really incredible. Awesome. Um, and, Can't uh, wait. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I can't wait. Yeah, I can't wait for you to see it. Ah, I've only seen like cell phone videos. Sorry, I mean, not to, not to spoil anybody <laughs> on YouTube, but yeah, I've only well, seen cell phones. Well, that's good. Well, no, but but <laughs> yeah, but then you've got the whole thing to look forward to. You can exactly. literally sit down one night and just <laughs> yes. turn the volume up and just experience it and really, yeah. really enjoy it. Yes. yes, yes, I have it pre-ordered. We'll have a movie night. So yes, we're ready. <laughs> All right. So any ideas you've had for, for this tour or other step shows so far that either haven't quite fit or you weren't able to convince the group of? No, there really isn't. Um, oh. There really isn't any time to kind of, I mean, it, it's just, and also I think it's such a close knit thing now. And certainly with Frank and I, I mean, Frank and I have worked together for a very long time now on very, on lots of different things. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, we, we that process of can we do this? Should we do that? That all happens way, way in advance. I mean, I, I usually start working on a tour probably about six months mm -hmm. before opening night, maybe before that. Hmm. Um, and then once uh, from opening night, I go probably to the first two and then let it go off. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, so so, yeah, we, there's sometimes there's songs that we try uh we try and put it in and sometimes things get cut for time mm. so sometimes we watch the show and we just think yeah actually that's lovely but it, it's just one song too many mm -hmm. um but i don't think it i think with this show there was nothing from the original draft that there wasn't in things moved around a bit in, in in where they were but um no there wasn't there's nothing that i'm there's nothing where i was like oh i had this idea to do this and nobody mm -hmm. liked it, it oh. it's we, we all it's kind of quite a cool joined up thinking everyone is on the same page which is really helpful oh that is lovely having that synced up mindset with the whole group you know one brain <laughs> but um yeah. with this show that you, you said you were satisfied but with any other show or any other step song you're just thinking about the discography is there any song that you haven't had the chance to interpret that you would like to kind of you know work around and you're like, oh i had this idea if they ask me i'm doing it <laughs> <laughs> um i think there was a <laughs> No, I mean, there's songs that I think that, you, that, that, you know, if the thing is what we what we avoided this time, apart from when we did, um, uh, in fact, we've avoided most of the times, actually, hmm. is we haven't really done any kind of straight covers, as in they've done mm -hmm. covers oh, that they've recorded. Yeah. But yeah. it's rare that we've gone in and said, apart from, well, apart from Vulu Vu, which was, which was, was something else. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, their catalogue is so strong. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there's anything that, um, that, that I mean, I, I, I'm sure if I went back so the other, I mean, of course, yeah, I mean, you know, there's, 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 if you were to get into something that wasn't an arena show, then I'm sure there's kind of the whole deep cuts thing where oh, yeah. there's people that love, there's certain songs that people love, mm -hmm. like, um, you know, I Surrender and I yes. Will Love Again, which mm -hmm. I adore, um, mm -hmm. and those kind of songs. So there, there, there are a few from the back catalogue that I think you could do, but they wouldn't necessarily be right in arenas. Yeah. Um, Got unless you. they were part of the med part of medley or if they ever did a as you say like a more an abbey road-esque thing mm -hmm. um yeah. or a more stripped back band thing then you could get away with trying some of those things mm. yes but uh, no i'm i'm super happy with everything we've done awesome yes i think the biggest challenge might be track seven experience oh my God, yes. from <laughs> step one which is usually noted as steps worst song by many of the fans uh that'd be <laughs> I think that'd be interesting. I, you know if what? You ever I, I think that on one's. That. I think I've drawn. Yeah, I think I'm. Yeah, you don't need to listen to it. It's okay. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, so you you mentioned you have written a song with H and Claire before, um, yeah. and you've also worked with Claire on her solo material. So, any interest in yeah. writing original music for Steps in the future, and any ideas of what type of sound or themes you might go for? Um, I. I think the writing thing, they've got such really great teams. And mm -hmm. um, I, I did, I've, I, I've done less and less writing. Um, uh, I did, the, the Claire one was, we did because we almost started out like that. I mean, the Claire album took, we started talking about doing that album in, I think, 2012 or something. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it was, it just went on and on and on to try and find the right things. Um, so I enjoyed doing that. I, I will write things if, if, if it's if I'm in the mood or if I'm producing like with Kylie, I wrote a lot of the Christmas songs and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Yes. Um, so for steps, I mean, th th there's uh, I, if I was a right, if, if my main job was a writer, then yes, I would say, OK, look, it'd be great to try and put something in there. But their writers are fantastic. I mean, you know, especially someone like Fiona Bevan, who was who did Future Holds, uh, mm -hmm. who did. Um, so uh, what was the first 
uh, Scared of the Dark. Mm. Yeah, that was such an uh, amazing song. So um, if I was right, if I was in a real writing moment and I had a good idea, then yes, I'd do it. But it's not been the priority recently. Right. Oh. Makes sense. I mean, your transition, uh, you know, into the tears of, of, of from being a DJ to a songwriter to like a producer and now you're a musical director. I think you've kind of you kind of touched everything, which is good. That's amazing. I mean, you've done great work. It's, we really appreciate everything you've done. And I mean, even me like being a new fan, I was like, who is this? Who did this? And he tells me, I'm like, he did it. And then we go do another review. He did it. Steve. I was like, we got to talk to him. He's great. Yes. You were number one on our, oh, our really cool. ideal guest list. So we're yeah. so thankful that you came on. Totally. Oh, that's, well, that's very kind. And it's also really nice to hear because a lot of the acts that I work with are, you know, are not necessarily, you know, steps included are not necessarily acts that are massively successful in, in the country you live in. Mm -hmm. right. So it's really, really nice that, um, that, it, that it translates. <laughs> Definitely. Yes, yeah. people here are definitely missing out for sure. <laughs> yeah, I just, uh -huh. don't even get us started. Um, but yes, with that being said, thank you so much for joining us here on CCTV. We are so honored to have you as our guest and we can't wait to hear what you do next. And you are truly a pop genius. Okay, so <laughs> thank you again. We, thank the you. CCTV crew thanks you. Steps fans, thank you. Mm -hmm. Kylie fans, thank you. We all thank you. <laughs> yes. Well, th th thank you for for, for being fans of the band and being so supportive and, uh, and 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 loving it as well yes. so because uh, that's that's why why any of us do the only reason why any of us do what we do is for the audiences so you know when they can be as appreciative as you then it, it, it's great to get that feedback yeah, it's it's a great relationship between the audience and yes, uh, and we know, love yes. even all the subtle things you're doing. Yeah. We hear them, we hear them. so we, yeah, it, it really you. is awesome to hear all of your <laughs> arrangements for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So speaking of, of all the things you do do, you also have some other things going on in your own life. So where can people find you? What what more would you like people to know before we close out? Oh, uh, okay. Here's the bit I'm usually not very good at. I'm <laughs> I'm sort of on most socials. I'm Mr. Steve Anderson, and I am. Currently, well, we've just finished up a whole bunch of shows, actually. So I said, so, so Step Summer went out. Um, I'm, I work for a musical director for Westlife. So they're, yes. they've just done five stadiums, including Wembley Stadium. And their arena tour goes out in December. So they did that. Um, I work on, there's a, a, a thing called Louise Redknapp, who used to be an Eternal. So her summer shows were done this year. I also do... I work on a, I have a, a really cool uh, uh, orchestral show called 80s Classical, which is the biggest 80s stars with symphony orchestra. Um, awesome. So we've had those and that's going out again. So yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff. And, um, and in lockdown, I started, uh, wisely or unwisely, I don't know, I started a podcast called Such a Good Feeling. And, um, and it was really just to have a reason to talk to my friends. And, 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 and I noticed that, some of them that were well, my friends that hadn't been represented very much in the podcast world. The interviews weren't there and they're long form interviews and they're not even interviews. They're just chats. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but I carried on doing it because I was getting such incredible um, reactions from people who were because because the, the show is very much about the kind of sliding doors moments. It's about those. I'm sure you two have had them in your life where, mm -hmm. you know, something and definitely as a singer, you will have had them where there's a thing that you really wanted and it hasn't happened and you're really upset, but then something else comes around and you couldn't have taken it if that thing had happened. So yeah. being dropped into situations that have changed your life without you really even thinking about it. So, uh, and everybody in a creative situation, it has had that happen to them once mm -hmm. or twice. Mm -hmm. um, they've just happened to meet someone that's changed their life. So, so that's what the show's about. And it's, it's writers and producers and singers and, and Claire's been on it as well. Yes. Claire's, Claire's done it. And um, it's been really fun. So I was going to, I thought it was going to last about three months and then I was going to stop, but I've carried it on and <laughs> I don't do it as much because um, I'm, I'm busy, but I really enjoy it. And uh, it's it's kind of super fun. So yeah, that that that's me. I'm always doing stuff and, and productions and, and, and various things. There's always something going on. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, no, listen, lovely to talk to you. And uh, yeah, and good luck with everything. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
Hope you enjoyed this interview and be sure to let us know who you'd like to hear on the show. You can message us at CCTV Pops on all social media and you can also join us on Patreon. Please give us a like, subscribe to our channel and hit that notification bell. For our listeners, give us a rating and a review on your podcast platform of choice. Until next time, that's Chris. That's Shan. And we are CCTV.